metatranscriptomics. Uh, these are the learning objectives. You should have a sense after this lecture, perhaps, and undergoing the tutorial, um, potentially about the opportunities and some of the challenges associated with metatranscriptomics analyses. Maybe understand something about the capabilities of what metatranscriptomics can actually do. Gain an appreciation of sample collection, briefly discuss issues of experimental design. And also, perhaps importantly from this bioinformatics workshop perspective, learn something about how do we process what are actually quite complex data sets. Um, and so the tutorial will take you through a set, uh, so it's a, it's a small data set extracted from a cow rumen that was generated, uh, I think about 2012, so it's 100,000 reads to keep it relatively small, but you'll be processing those and just seeing what happens at each of the various steps of processing and where various kind of errors and what you actually find in these data sets. All right, so the overview of the lecture, um, I'll go over what is metatranscriptomics and how does it relate to RNA-seq and how does it not relate, how is it different to um, our traditional RNA-seq, what we understand by RNA-seq. Um, I'll go over issues of experimental design, sample collection, preparation and so forth, and then uh, take you through the various steps of processing these reads. So what is it that we need to take into account when we're actually taking our data set and we're processing it and we're trying to get some information out of it. I briefly mentioned something about statistical analysis. For metatranscriptomics, uh, it's a relatively new field. The bar for publishing is really still quite low. So in terms of the statistics, there just aren't the tools and methods that have been developed out there. So it's a wide open field for developing um, new kinds of analyses. And then visualization. So how do we visualize the output? And um, I'll be pushing this concept of using these kind of systems-based data sets to layer on, if you like, um, to have these systems-based networks as a scaffold in which you can layer on your metatranscriptomic data to help interpret something about what's actually happening in your sample. All right, so um, uh, I think um, Morgan went over kind of these differences yesterday. So 16 sRNA surveys. These are um, relatively simplistic in terms of you just want to get an idea of who is there. So you're getting using 16S as a marker gene just to identify what, who is in your actual sample. Uh, it's been really widely applied. It's uh, the technique that's um, received the most attention over the last uh, eight years or so. But the problem with these 16S surveys is that they really yield only limited uh, kind of functional mechanistic insights, if you like. So uh, up here, this is a study of um, GI tracts of healthy individual. And as you go down the GI tract, you find that the different taxonomic groups uh, alter in proportion. But you see that the IBD gut is very, very different to the healthy gut. But the problem is, is that you don't know if this is a cause or a consequence of IBD. So is it just because the IBD gut is so messed up that it's now home to all these other bacteria? So the 16S RNA surveys are really just giving you relatively limited insights as to what's actually happening. Metagenomics. Um, on the other hand, given you the potential to look at what your bugs can actually do. Okay, so this was a study from the uh, uh, Microbiome Consortium 2012. And in the top panel here, you've got all the different taxa across 120 individuals across these different body types. It's called Tom, and so forth. You can see in the top panel there, each of these individuals really has quite a different kind of composition in terms of what bugs are actually there. But in this bottom panel, this is a metagenomics analysis where they interpreted the different uh, functional categories. In this case, this was uh, <coughs> metabolic pathways that are expressed again across these different 120 individuals in these uh, eight or so different body sites. And you can see that the functions appear to be relatively stable. So the idea is, is that maybe it doesn't matter what bugs you have because they're still capable of giving you the same functionality. And then the next step in this kind of uh, 
uh, process is metatranscriptomics. And this goes a little bit beyond metagenomics. So metagenomics is really giving you an idea of the functional potential, but it's not saying what's actually expressed. But that's what metatranscriptomics, that's where metatranscriptomics comes in. It's really telling you who is doing what in the sample. So it's looking at the microbiome activity, what is actually active within your sample. Uh, and the way it does this is by using RNA-seq. Um, and RNA-seq we, we've probably heard a lot about, um, but we're using RNA-seq in this context to really determine what genes, what pathways are actually being actively expressed within this community. And so, as I mentioned, we can have these kinds of uh, systems called data sets. This is really okay. It's a map issue. Anyway, these are these kind of protein interaction networks that might represent things like protein complexes or uh, biological pathways. And you can layer on your metatranscriptomic data sets to see which of these nodes, and these nodes represent different proteins involved in these pathways. The relative expressions so the size of the node, the larger the node, the more reads, the more expressed that particular protein is. Um, and then you can use these kind of pie charts for each of these different proteins to indicate which taxonomic groups are responsible for each of those different functions. So again, the idea is that then comes to the to reveal the active functions, so the size of the nodes. And then by using this kind of pie chart picture, you can reveal which taxa are really responsible for these active functions within these networks. And the lines between, the lines between all the pie charts kind of represent? Uh, a, uh, in this case, a functional interaction. So these genes are known to functionally interact with each other, so they're involved in a similar pathway. So you're looking for groups of genes which are highly interlinked, suggesting they might be involved in a biochemical process such as um, a TCA cycle, or they might be involved in a protein complex, involved in a transport activity, or so forth. And we discuss more of that towards the end. Um, these are results from a study that we've been um, looking at this year, again, just to emphasize the importance of looking at the transcriptomic data and this activity data. So this is with a colleague in Colorado, and um, he took um, this mutant mouse line, so it's perilipin 2. This is a gene that's involved, I believe, in fat transport um, in mice. And he fed these mice high-fat diet um, along with the wild-type mouse. And this is the phylogenetic distribution, so which facts are actually present in the sequence of these two types of mice. So under the high-fat diet, pin 2, knockout mice, wild-type mice, you can see that the types of bacteria that you find, the phyla, very similar. Okay, so you've got a similar distribution of bacteria within the guts of these mice. However, when we look at the actual, because we've done metatranscriptomics, when we actually map them onto the functions, we find that certain metabolic pathways encoded by the bacteria are actually differentially expressed. And I think there is about 14 different metabolic pathways which exhibit this differential metabolic expression. So to give you a couple of examples, here we have uh, these are two enzymes that are in the branch chain amino acid pathway. Again, these nodes represent the relative contribution of different taxonomic groups that are expressing these different enzyme activities. You can see that this particular enzyme activity has increased in the PIN2 mutant. This enzyme has gone down in the PIN2 mutant. So the idea is that the genotype of the mouse is actually affecting which genes are being expressed by the microbiome. So again, this isn't something that we would necessarily pick up through 16S or through metagenomics. So I think the story that we're kind of settling on here is that because this PLIN2 mouse is deficient in doing fat transport under a high fat diet, you end up with the accumulation of these fats in the lumen of the intestine. As a consequence, the energy pathways are getting um, undergoing altered um, regulation uh, in order to account for this accumulation of this, uh, these fatty acid substrates. So again, this is really just to emphasize why we believe that metatranscriptomics is really an important kind of aspect of studying the microbiome. So any questions on the whys and wherefores so far? Oh, good. All right, so how do we go about doing metatranscriptomics? So it's based on RNA-seq. Who hasn't heard of RNA-seq? Okay, great. Um, so this is really a 
diagram of the pipeline as to how we do an RNA seq and analysis. Um, Try to analyze all of uh, the transcriptome relays. We've got our sample at the top, so it might be the context of seq and mail to extract the RNA. So the RNA is really all the transcripts that might be associated with that particular sample, and uh, obviously showing differential abundance at that point. You fragment each of these different transcripts and the sequence, and then once you've got all these sequences, you align all of these reads to known transcripts to a pretty relative expression, and you end up with a kind of a digital readout of gene expression, if you like, just by the number of reads that are mapping to your known transcripts. So typically, RNA-seq has been applied to organisms with a reference genome. So you're getting these little fragments of these reads, and they're mapping to a reference genome that you already have. So you might do RNA-seq on a mouse, and then you're generating all these reads, and then you get a readout of all of the relative expression of the genes that the mouse is expressing at that point in time. However, applied to microbiome, um, we have a number of additional challenges associated with this whole process. Okay, so if we think about a typical RNA-seq experiment, it's typically applied uh, largely to eukaryotic organisms, mRNA is isolated, our fragmentation and sequencing reads are mapped to a reference genome, and there's a number of standard software uh, that's available, MAC, BWA. Um, and when you do this mapping, this provides support that, first of all, the transcript is actually expressed, so that's why a lot of people are doing these uh, kind of RNA-seq experiments. They just want to confirm the expression of their transcripts. They also look at the relative abundance of the transcripts, so which transcripts tend to be up or down regulated between different samples. And you can also detect uh, different isoforms, so uh, particularly for eukaryotes, uh, you can have alternative splicing, and RNA-seq is a way of seeing what the differential splicing patterns are, uh, again, between samples. However, for microbiome samples, we have some considerable problems. First of all, we have a lack of a poly-A tail. Okay, so for RNA-seq, extracting the RNA is pretty easy because you just do this poly-A enrichment. <coughs> in um, in microbiome samples, we don't have this poly-A tail. Okay, so it can be difficult to isolate bacterial messenger RNA. And so this results in really massive ribosomal RNA accumulation. So most of the <coughs> RNA that you get within your samples is ribosomal RNA. So that's a huge problem. How do we separate the mRNA from the rRNA? The other problem we face is that these environmental microbiome samples, depending on what we are trying to analyze, we just don't have these reference genome data sets. So the actual mapping and trying to <coughs> identify what the origin of each of our reads and our sequence data is and what gene it actually belongs to, again, is a very challenging proposition. Sorry, why is it So our RNA is ribosomal RNA. So these are the RNAs that are responsible for uh, forming the ribosome and helping um, protein production. So they're very abundant because you need to have a lot of these in order to generate a lot of um, proteins. Whereas the mRNA is actually the message that is translated by the ribosomes to form the actual protein. So the rRNA is really just a machine which is generating all of the proteins. So if we want to understand what proteins are actually being expressed, then we need to target the messenger RNAs. So they're the actual transcripts which are then feeding into the production of proteins. What happens if you have a really like, local abundance mRNA? Does it get caught? Does it get removed? Does it get removed? You just won't detect it. No. So, um, again, it's the same issue with the metagenomics that the really low abundance ones, if you've only got one or, two, say, one or two of these reads in your data set, they tend to just get thrown out. I don't know how it works for the, the bacteria, but for eukaryotes, sometimes, like, an uh, mRNA species can be highly, like, synthesized, but actually not being translated into protein. Right. So... So that's, that's a very good point. So the correlation between um, mRNA expression and protein expression isn't necessarily linear. 
Um, so people are now proposing doing metaproteomics, which we're not going to discuss today, but this is where you take your sample and you're basically doing a shotgun proteomics on that sample, fitting it into a mass spec machine and then determining what proteins are actually within that particular sample. But that has its own sets of issues as well because you really get swamped with high abundant proteins and so you don't get very much signal back. I read a paper um, many years ago, I think, that some people was doing a study um, showed that the um, MRA being translated in protein rate is in human is 70%. Is that correct? Do you agree with that? I mean, the number I remember is quite high. I'm a little bit surprised at that high, but... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect it, it might also vary from organism to organism, and also upon the conditions that the organism is actually being exposed to as well. So there's probably a lot of factors that feed into it. And there's very little data concerning bacteria and the relationship between uh, mRNA expression in bacteria and, and protein abundance as well. Well, I, I know for plants, they engineer like <coughs> ribosome with these tags on them. So basically, you freeze your cells, extract their ribosome, and you basically capture all the RNA that are actually inside the ribosome. And you can, and you can do like a parallel with this standard RDC procedure, and then this capturing thing and then you can compare like which of the RNAs are actually present and are being like processed to the rivals and stuff like that. Right. But like it's not enough to pull for that. There's also huge issues in terms of post-translation modifications making the proteins active and then also the amount of protein turnover. So some proteins tend to be more stable and last longer in the cell than other proteins. So all of these things are an additional level of complexity that we're, we're not going to really tackle today with okay. metatranscriptomics. Also. Sorry, Morgan. All right. If you have a sample that has like uh, high diversity compared to one that has low diversity, does that affect your RNA seq results? Uh, more than likely. I don't think, again, we've done the studies to actually look at that in too much depth, but certainly um, having. Um, reference genomes um, for a sample that you're doing metatranscriptomics on and having a more simple, if you like, microbiome makes it a lot easier to annotate and I've got a slide which kind of shows that. About ribodepletion kits. Yes. Yes. All right, so what does our metatranscriptomic analysis pipeline look like? Uh, we've got our RNA from the mouse, character sequencing, we generate the reads. Once we generate the reads, what do we need to do with these reads to actually extract the information that is of interest to us? First of all, we need to remove low quality sequences. Okay, this is quite an issue from sample to sample. So we looked at one. Uh, sample that somebody had deposited at the NCBI from the permafrost and around about 98% of that sample was low quality sequence. How it appeared in the NCBI, I don't know, but it was again a data set that incredibly low uh, quality. Uh, after we screen for low quality, we now need to identify the rate of time of reads, so that's a major step. Um, and uh, there are different tools that are more sensitive uh, for detecting ribosomal RNA um, reads, and that can be quite a slow step, unfortunately. Uh, if we're dealing with a sample that is associated with host, we might want to remove those host reads before we do any downstream analysis, um, and so we need to identify which reads are associated with the host. Uh, we like doing an assembly step. This is important because the longer fragments of RNA we can get, the better probability we have in terms of being able to annotate it. Okay, and I'll show a graph as to um, the relationship between length, sequence length, and our ability to annotate. 
Once we've done the assembly, we then map it to some known genes to identify the bacterial transcripts associated with each disease. And then we might think about mapping it to some kind of pathways to help interpret our results. Maybe form some kind of sample comparisons. So that's the, I, I guess, the key steps in any kind of analytical pipeline for metatranscriptomics. Okay, so the first step, sample collection, RNA extraction. So we had a brief discussion on this yesterday about what are the best practices in terms of collecting and storing our samples, and there really aren't any SOPs out there. People are still trying their own ad hoc methods, and it's not clear what the best methods are for collecting RNA, storing it before we actually uh, start sequencing it. And we know that depending on the method of storage, the method of preparation, this can really dramatically impact um, things like which taxa can be recovered. So our current best kind of suggestion is that you process your sample immediately to extract the RNA and then you can store the RNA at minus 80 and it tends to be relatively stable. The next best is to snap freeze liquid nitrogen, for example, again in store at minus 80. However, as we know, when we're dealing with clinical samples, and you've got your MD or um, who's in the operating theater taking a biopsy, for example, uh, having liquid nitrogen around might not be the best. And so there are certain compromises that you have to come up with in order to um, be able to get these samples in the first place. So just be aware that depending on the quality of the sample that you are able to get hold of, that might actually impact the results that you get. Uh, we would actually suggest uh, avoiding the use of RNA later. So this is a chemical that you can add to your RNA samples to make them more stable. However, um, there's some results which are suggesting that it can interfere with RNA extraction kits. Um, and so again, you might get biases associated with the use of something like RNA later. Okay, so... Um, in terms of collecting these samples, how many samples do we need to collect? How many biological replicates? The issue with metatranscriptomics is that it is relatively expensive, so it's generally expensive in the use of sample. I'll mention why we come up with that number in a bit. Around about 300 to $400. I don't know how much Morgan's charging these days. Probably about that. Probably, probably about that. So it's relatively expensive, so um, experimentalists, MDs, are a little shy in terms of wanting to generate uh, biological replicates. So we would suggest at least two, but um, when people have doing, been doing RNA-seq experiments, really the, the minimum that you should be doing is four, and you can just about get away with three. But again, I'll mention that for metatranscriptomics, the bar for publishing, again, is relatively low. So you can probably get away with probably two, two replicates. So sorry, by two, you mean two different individuals? You don't need two samples from the same individual? Uh, two samples from the same individual, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is where the power analyses come in and uh, there really aren't any good frameworks that have been developed so far for doing power analyses of metatranscriptomics. So again, until these kinds of issues get resolved and then the bar starts getting raised, um, you can see these kind of experiments more as hypothesis generation. Okay, so to get an idea of potentially pathways or genes that might be upregulated in your sample of interest, which you can then go in and design more appropriate experiments with the power that you need to actually give you the statistics. You can't get a biological replicate if you just take two samples from the I guess the way I'm thinking about it is if we're taking biopsies from kids' intestines, you're taking two different sites, um, we, we'd want to do that. You need to pull your RNA extraction to get the amount that you need to do sequencing. Or you try to avoid that and just using one extraction. We try to avoid that. Yeah, I really wouldn't recommend doing pooling of samples if you can avoid it. But again, yeah. you can be constrained by what samples you can actually get hold of. So, 
it's all about these kind of compromises, but be aware of how these different compromises may actually impact the interpretation. Yeah. Just, I don't know if it's an obvious question, but can I want to hear your answer. Why do you keep two numbers in the same individual? So the 16S and, and, and um, shotgun sequence and whatever, we've never said this yet, but I can imagine that people are saying, you know, why should you get two numbers in the same individual at the same time? Why do you need it uh, well, I would well, I, I would suggest that you do it for all of these kinds of analyses. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Morgan, what well, what would you suggest for biological replicates? Uh, but, and just to clarify, you mean two samples in the same individual at the same time, so you're just kind of yeah, okay, you're not saying you know the sample's there, the sample next month, two samples, same individual, same time. I think the Um, sorry, I'm not following. So, in terms of like instead of doing meta transcriptomics on your sense, is there a cheaper method to kind of confirm you're on the right track? So, I would suggest that you see these as a kind of discovery phase, and then you do more cost-effective experiments subsequent to that, using, for example, targeted PCRs or. I think it comes down to sort of RNA-seq in the traditional sense, right? People do those do replicates and then stabilize for the average or use statistics to figure out what the actual level is. Versus when you're if we didn't have analytic replicates, we can also do static replicates with maps. There's no two maps. I think it's A number of papers just for sequencing or that say that if you can afford like 60 million reads, you're better off splitting 60 million into 20 million per replicate. So you get a better statistical power than you would by doing something else, right? So if that's the constraint, splitting that, splitting your sequencing into three different sets would make it cheaper. Get the same amount of sequencing. Although you're, if, if you you, again, it depends with the RNA seq. You can probably get away with more limited number of reads because you've got a more limited set of transcripts which are actually present in that. Whereas here, if you want to capture the depth of the transcripts that have been expressed by a lot of different organisms and a lot of different pathways, that's adding a, an additional level of complexity. So, for example, in the where is it? This PLIN2 study. This is where we use four replicates. And you could see that actually for they there was quite a bit of difference within a sample across those four replicates. So it it is an issue doing these biological replicates for these experiments is an issue. And you're right, they are they are expensive, and these are expensive experiments. Sorry, to, uh, I look at this your, this slide. Uh, yeah, in slight horror, we thought snap freezing gut microbiome samples. So obviously, for I, I, I guess you're talking about stool samples. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm um, totally obsessed on one area. Yeah. So um, the stool sample just needs to be dumped in the fridge. Bad choice of words. Um, needs to be dumped in the fridge as quickly as possible, and then and then you're hoping that they're going to bring it in as soon as they can. But for a lot of those experiments as well, I mean, you look, you're wanting to take stool samples, probably sampling from the same individual three times over a week to account for the impact of diet as well over, over that week. Oh, so you're getting a bit more relaxed now, so that's probably not snap freezing, but you're saying, 
It's all you can do in practice. Uh, again, this comes back to that discussion we had yesterday that it's it's uh, staggering that there are so few studies that have actually tried to look at these kinds of storage conditions. So I do have a couple of slides which kind of address that a bit, but again, they're, they're a little bit unsatisfactory, but um, we, we, we get a little bit more into that in a couple more slides. That could also just be just in paper that you just see how the RC changes over time in the school cycle, just even that would be interesting to know how active the bacteria are in the school cycle as they basically wait for the process. Would you like to fund that study? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm a master's student. Though. <laughs> so when we collect uh, the hot samples, we just hope that liquid nitrogen. <laughs> Every 15 minutes we just go to the facility <coughs> and they poop and just collect them. So what if humans would do that? Let's try that. <laughs> the, the, the other thing it might be, the, the other thing it might be worth mentioning as well is um, we've actually been a little reluctant ourselves in wanting to do stool samples for metatranscriptomics because we feel it's not really reflective of what's happening higher up in the intestine and so we're really focusing these kind of metatranscriptomic studies on the more informative sites, so biopsies. And... All right, so we've got our sample, which is super awesome because we've got this person to come into the lab and donate straight into liquid nitrogen. Um, but we now have this problem that these bacterial mRNAs lack this poly-A tail that eukaryotic RNAs do. So how do we remove these abundant RNA species, which can account for about 99% of all the RNAs within the sample? So there's a number of kits that are available. Um, the one that we've been using is this Drive 0 kit from Lever. This is their results. So here, if you go to the of their kits, this is what they're showing. The amount of RNA, RNA is 72% that they recover, and the amount that's back to the genome is 4.5%. However, with their kit, Fantastic. I mean, 6% is RNA, and then the rest is all, or 70% of it is messenger RNA. Um, we haven't quite had the same success as these guys. Um, so we're, we're, I think we're able to get about 30%. Okay, so they do a reasonable job, and um, I think the Ribo Zero Kit is probably the best one that's currently available on the market, but presumably. Over the next few years, we would expect to see more of these depletion kits appear and get more and more successful. So this is from a study that um, we did recently. So these are about six different samples, um, metatranscriptomic samples, and just processing them and determining what uh, is actually in these samples. You can see that there's lots. So permafrost, this was the one that I was mentioning, you can see that this um, Gray bar, adapted low quality, so that was a really horrible sample. Um, here we have a cow rumen, we have a kimchi data set, and this red is the ribosome larvae, so it's a lot. Of, what you're actually after is light blue. Yeah, so typically a lot of these studies are, you're really looking at about 10 to 20 percent messenger RNA recovering. Yeah. So I've been asking this question with my own data, but where's the other 25 percent? You're assuming you're already filtering low quality reads. Is it just reads you can't map? And why can't you map those reads early, don't we? Um, so I didn't generate that. No, no, I know. So I don't I, know. I, I don't know if that includes the low quality. It might include the low quality. Okay. It might include adapters. Um, it might include host. So. Okay. So for those kind of so if you sequence the uh, R on the M on the they are like 180 pair or whatever the lens. What the feature distinguishes these small pieces, one one RNA species versus the other? Um, 
So in terms of how are you able to identify, separate, filter out the ribosomal RNA from the messenger RNA? Yeah. Um, so again, I'll get to that, but we use a tool called Infernal, um, which is a hidden Markov model tool, which does a pretty, is, is pretty sensitive. You can use BLAST, and BLAST will capture, I think, about 70 or 80% of the ribosomal RNAs, but you're still missing about 20%. That's why we switched over to the Infernal. And just to mention that host messenger RNAs can prove challenging, so depending on the sample, so we did a stool sample recently, um, to see uh, out of 16 different preparation methods which is likely to recover the most bacterial RNA but we ended up out of all the messenger RNA we recovered about 80 to 90 percent of it was human which is quite unusual for this stool sample but it might have been the patient that it came from but nonetheless the host messenger RNAs can be quite informative because it gives you an idea of the host cells that are in or neighboring the microbiome, how the microbiome is actually changing the host gene expression as well. So you could think about using these host reads to get a readout on host gene expression. All right, so this was a study that we did last year, which was comparing different types of storage and RNA treatments. Um, and what these plots show here are kind of host reads, which is the dark plot, and then the small one is the actual putative messenger RNA from bacteria. So really heavily dominated by a host. But in terms of comparison to storage in RNA treatments and being able to recover messenger RNAs, we find that freezing seems to have a negative impact on these samples, so you, across each of these different six <coughs> methods. Um, Any time that we freeze these samples, we seem to recover less mRNAs. Fresh is obviously better than storing it. It's a bit longer term, than one week. Uh, even if you store it at minus 20 or you store it in the fridge or whatever. So preparing your samples fresh is a lot better. We found that the ribosome zero kit is better than the ribosome express kit in terms of depleting ribosome RNAs. And we did try RNA later, and it does look so RNA later is increasing your ability to recover RNAs, but we still have concerns about biases that the RNA later might be putting in in terms of the type of taxa that you are able to recover. Uh, I'm, I'm having um, philosophical issues about writing this up at the moment, so. <laughs> Mainly because most of the reads are from the host, and um, in order to get this stool sample, uh, I think we only got verbal ethic approval to study it. So we're really interested in analysing the bacteria, so it's not clear to me that we can actually deposit the host RNA material because of these kind of issues. So I'm trying to wrap my head around that. All right, so generating the reads, we've got our samples, we've extracted the RNA, looking super great. How many reads do we need to generate? So again, in the study where we're looking at these four different um, metatranscript meta data sets, we did this rare fraction analysis see how many reads do we need to sample to get so many, in this case, enzymes. Okay, so we think that within our microbiome we have a limited number of enzymes that are actually being expressed. So as we sample more, more we increase the number of reads, then we can see that we're kind of leveling off around about yeah, five reads. Okay, so if we think that um, Within our sample and with our sequencing run, around about 25% of our reads are going to be from mRNA. Then we need four times five million, so we need about 20 million reads. Okay? Are we following the maths there? Okay, good. So we would suggest generating around about 20 million reads per sample, and that would give you anything from about 90 to 95% of the enzymes we would expect to find expressed within that sample. Okay, any questions on that? Good. All right, so now the fun part and why we're here, analyzing the data. So again, it's a relatively new field. Um, there, 
st software standards, SOPs, really haven't been uh, put in place yet. And also, uh, it's a really rapidly developing field, so there's always new tools that are being developed all the time. And so the way that we would view the development, and anyone who's developing a metatranscriptomic analysis pipeline, is that you have a kind of a framework, and then you can swap in the different tools as they improve your ability, your accuracy, to actually recover information and um, filter out unwanted reads. Okay, so when you're thinking about developing this pipeline, it's really a set of wrapper scripts, Perl scripts, Python scripts, or whatever. We're old school, so we use Perl. Um, but most of the bioinformatics is really not about the tools themselves, but it's reformatting the data to feed in from one tool to feed into the other tool. So a lot of the scripts that you'll be running during the tutorial are really focused really just on putting things in the right format. Um, so when we look at the actual tools, what we need to do, we have the most established methods, so the processing methods where we're actually filtering out low quality, for example, or adapters. Uh, these are fairly well established now because they've been applied to metagenomics, to 16S surveys, to uh, even genomic software. We have assembly methods which are pretty well established now. Um, so we use one called Trinity and it does a pretty good job in terms of assembly. Um, where we're starting to have our annotation methods. So if we're generating these metatranscriptomic data sets, Generally, in one sequence run, we get about 400, 500 million reads. You've got to somehow, once you've filtered out all the chaff, you've got to somehow annotate those reads with some kind of function. And this can be really, really time consuming. So this is where you need cluster computing in order to give you the computational capacity to be able to annotate these reads and actually assign some kind of function, um, some kind of taxonomic information associated with each of these reads. And then we get to analysis methods, and again, there's been so few studies that have been published for metatranscriptomics that these really haven't been developed at all, so these established. So again, just to emphasize that when you're developing, if you're interested in doing metatranscriptomics, you're developing these pipelines, again, it's really about getting these wrapper scripts and then feeding in the different tools that you need to do those steps of the filtering and identifying what you actually want to get out of these data sets. Okay, so in terms of read processing, filtering, um, so we have a number of tools that are out there to actually do this filtering. We've been using one called Trimomatic. Uh, there are others out there. There will be new ones that appear all the time. Um, but this one seems to be reasonably quick. Uh, fills our needs at least for the time being. How it works is that it has this kind of a sliding window that it moves across the sequence and it tries to look at regions that are of low quality and then it trims off, goes back and trims off the stuff that it seems low quality. And then there's this color that you can set that reads that are below a certain length, it just kind of chops off and discards them. Uh, but there are other tools out there that um, perform a similar job to this, and we don't really see this as a major kind of issue, at least for now, within our minute transcriptomic pipeline. So that's good. Assembly, why do we need to assemble our metatranscriptomic data? So the idea is that it really improves our annotation accuracy. So as we go across here, uh, I don't know if it's printed out better in the sheet than the actual numbers, but right about here is, I think that's about 100 bases there, actually up to about 200 bases, your ability to annotate really increased up to around about 80 to 90%. Where if you've lower about 100 bases, your ability to annotate, and this is using a tool such as BLAST, really decreases. So if you can get these longer reads, and you can do it by doing these assembly steps, then you dramatically increase your ability to annotate and assign some kind of function to these reads. Uh, this is just a simple graphic showing that Trinity is this bottom one, and this is the proportion of reads that we can actually annotate, and it performs better than some of these other methods. So we think this was our A sequence one, and then Meta Velvet was the other. And we find Trinity works pretty, pretty good. In fact, uh, when we were looking at a deep C metatranscriptome, we applied Trinity, and 
uh, I was very excited by the fact that despite all of the different reads and different taxa that are in there, we were able to actually assemble and recover the entire Phi X um, genome. So it's a spiking control, but the fact that you've got all of these other sequences in there that could create problems with the assembly, it, Trinity actually did a really good job in being able to recreate the entire Phi X genome. So I was pretty impressed that it has this ability to uh, sort out the noise and not get swamped by all these other sequences. So there are problems with chimeras. This is, uh, so this is when you get assembled contigs, where you get two sequences that may be from different organisms, but they share sequence similarity, and so they get merged together and assembled together. This can be a problem. We found that the incidence of these chimeras is relatively low, so around about 1% to 2%. So again, we're not too concerned about the presence of chimeras within these data sets. OK, so. We've got rid of all the chaff, um, all of the low quality sequence. We have um, assembled our data. How do we now annotate our data set? So this is probably the most challenging part. Um, so we typically rely on the sequence similarity search tools, BWA, BLAT, BLAST. So BWA and BLAT, these are super fast. So you can screen hundreds of millions of reads with BWA relatively quickly. Um, however, they really rely on these near-perfect matches. And the issue is when we're dealing with environmental samples is that sequence diversity is absolutely huge. So just to give you an example, this was a study from about 2008 or so where this group was um, sequencing a number of genomes from Streptococcus uh, lacti. Every time they sequence a new strain of this bacteria, they get a whole new bunch of sequences. Okay? So even different species of E. coli can vary by as many as about 2,000 genes. So there's huge species diversity. If we think we've only got about 9,000 reference bacterial genomes out there, and then we're trying to compare the millions and billions of different species that are out there, our ability to actually match really is significantly compromised. And so we find that BWA, BLAT, fast, accurate, but they really don't help very much unless you have the reference genomes um, that are associated with your um, metatranscriptome. So this is suggesting that maybe if you're doing a metatranscriptomic analysis, you might want to complement that with a metagenomic analysis, so you then got a reference genome to then do this kind of mapping. John, I have a question. So Trinity has their, their tool, Trinity, um, that uses a whole bunch of different uh, genomes and sequences. Do you have any tried using that um, after you've done the Trinity assemblies? To, to, to do the um, annotation? We, we have not. So Trinity is from the same school, I believe, as is it BWA and, and Bowtie. So um, so the database that we currently use is uh, a set of microbial genomes that we download from the NCBI, and then we use BWA to match across um, those data sets. But again, you can start expanding on, on these kind of databases. OK, so in practice, again, we're going back to our five different um, metatranscriptome samples here. Um, so beyond BWA and BLAT, we can think about using tools such as BLAST, which are a little bit imperfect. Um, and we find that rather than relying on nucleotide searches, we do a much better job if we think about working in peptide space. So because of this um, third base pair wobble, um, you can get a lot of diversity at the nucleotide level, but that isn't then propagated at the protein level. And so if we think about doing these blast X searches where you're doing this um, six-frame translation of your nucleotide against a protein data set, then our ability to annotate them um, really increases. However, one problem with BLAST is that it's very time-consuming, and again, you really need cloud or cluster computing. 
This is kind of getting overcome with tools such as Diamonds, and Morgan introduced me to one called vSearch, which is a free version of uSearch that might offer uh, speed ups. Um, Diamond in particular we found quite useful, but there are issues with these tools in, terming, in, in terms of quality. So the results that we get out from Diamond, where they're somewhat comparable to Blast, most of the time, about 90% of the time, they don't give exactly the same results as you might get from Blast. So, so in our current pipeline, what we're doing is we use a BWA search, we use a BAT search, and then we use a Blast search. And then you can see the performance of each of these different search packages really varies on the microphone that we're sampling. <coughs> so, Kimchi is doing really well. Okay, so, Kimchi, this purple line here is flat. Okay, so this is where you're looking for near perfect matches. And the reason why kimchi is doing so well is that we actually had reference genomes for the kimchi sample. And so we were able to annotate a lot of these reads from this kimchi metatranscriptome uh, really very well with these. However, for these other samples, cacao, mouse, deep sea, you can see that BWA, black, blast, only getting you as much as about 30% of the genes can you actually annotate. So this is a little bit disappointing. And then when we actually look at the quality of the matches, so these are relatively short reads. Um, so this, is a, this might be a typical match for a 71 base pair read. You have an E value of 39. Okay, For those of you who run BLAST, you're normally expecting something like E to the minus 39. This was actually 39. Okay, So statistically, it doesn't look like a great match. But if you look at the species that you actually recover, it looks about right. <coughs> So rather than relying on the Z values, um, our idea is to look at these kind of colors. So these are, um, as you go across a read length, this is the proportion of matches where you get a certain degree of match, so 80%, up to 100% of sequence match across different read lengths. And so we have a cutoff that kind of captures this region here. Okay. So we have a cutoff of about that's it. I think it's 85% sequence similarity across 65% of the read length is, is our kind of cutoff for um, getting a decent match. Okay, so we've processed our sample, we've identified what's in there, we've annotated our reads. What we need to do now is we need to normalize the expression of these reads. Okay, so this is a typical step that we do in RNA-seq. Um, and we need to take into the fact that different genes may have different lengths. And so if you have a really long gene, you're more likely to sample from a long gene because it's just a bigger gene. So we need to account for that. So there's this method um, which results in these reads put in a base of transcript maps or RDAM values. So this is where you're converting from your raw read numbers. So for example, converting the number of reads that are associated with each of these into an RPKM value which indicates what it's going to be expression. So this one here has the same number of reads as, as this gene here, but because it's much shorter, uh, the likelihood of getting reads coming from this is much lower, and so you end up with a much higher RPKM value. Okay, so it's a way of um, normalizing and accounting for the size of each of these transcripts. So there are several software tools that are available to do this, um, uh, such as Botan couplings. So we've done some kind of functional annotation. What about taxonomic annotation? We might actually want to know where these reads are coming from. What are the organisms that are responsible for expressing these particular genes? And again, this is just to um, emphasize again that uh, the actual species that you have in your sample can use the same functionality. Um, and then assigning these uh, RNA reads to specific taxa might give you uh, some clues as to what taxa are responsible for providing critical functions within your microbiome. Another area that we've been thinking about is maybe we might want to do this annotation set for taxonomic annotation prior to assembly. So that what we could do is we could separate all of our reads into these different bins from these different bacterial species and then assemble so that we don't have these problems with chimeras cropping in. 
So the issue is, how do we go about signing taxonomic information? So there's these alignment methods such as BLAST and BWA, but again, these can fail where we're lacking uh, suitable reference genomes. Um, and this is particularly a problem where we have short read data sets. So most of the focus has been on these compositional methods, uh, nucleotide frequency, code and biases, and so forth. Um, and so the idea is that you can classify all of your reads into all of your reads into frequencies of genes. So for each, so for a single read, you have a frequency of each of these different uh, treatments that are associated with it. And then you can use this profile, if you like, all these different treatments, uh, using something like the you know, Slater method to try and assign that sequence to a genome within a particular sequence space. Okay, so the idea is that you're coming out with some kind of KMA profile, some kind of signature of what that sequence actually looks like, and then trying to find the closest genome that it would actually map to. So there's a number of tools that kind of do this. NBC I uh, mentioned yesterday. Uh, Kraken is a pretty neat, relatively fast method. And one called Clark, which is really based on NBC and then is, is relatively fast, but has some problems as well. But the gold standard currently is NBC. It's just that it takes an awful long time to run. We've been developing, uh, so this is my, my advert, I guess. So we've been developing a tool called GIST um, to try and take these compositional metrics into account. Uh, so this is a computational pipeline. The idea here is that we're combining, it's an ensemble method, so we're combining six different methods into one, and then we're seeing which of these different methods really performs best for each of our different genomes. Okay, so we have different methods such as naive Bayes, we have the Gaussian mixture model, the EWA to see if we do actually get alignment against something. Um, so there's different methods involved, and the idea is that for each of these different genomes, we score how well each of these methods does in terms of discriminating that genome against all the other genomes. And so um, we can say, for example, for one particular genome, you might perform better assigning a sequence to that particular genome using an alignment method over some kind of compositional method. Okay, so you're really exploiting um, the ability of different methods to work better for assigning these kinds of matches um, across different genomes, if that makes sense. So in terms of performance, we've been applying it to, uh, this was a germ-free mouse where it was inoculated with a defined uh, microbiome called this altered Schedler flora, which is thought to comprise about eight different taxa. We compared it against GIST, there's letter CV, which was, uh, which was quite popular at the time again, relatively fast, and NBC. And then when we look at the different taxonomic bins that we get from these different methods, we find that GIST identifies, I think, about nine different taxa, which is um, reflecting the altered Schedler flora, which is thought to be eight, whereas NBC is about 15 or so. So we think that GIST is doing a relatively good performance. Um, where you don't have reference genomes in terms of being able to assign your reads to specific taxonomic groups. Sorry, I'm sure it would be the purpose of this slide, but I totally want to know what altered Schedler flora is. is. So this is a microbiome that uh, has been developed in the 90s to inoculate in mice under specific pathogen-free conditions in order to have a fairly standard microbiome that can be transferred from lab to lab to minimize the impact of a altered microflora on the results of what experiments they might be doing. What is ASF? ASF is altered Schedler flora. Okay, it's worth bearing in mind that the mRNA expression is not equivalent to the ribosomal RNA expression that you might get from the 16S sequencing. You do actually get uh, quite different um, distributions. And there's a number of reasons that might come about. One is that there might be biases in the ribosomal RNA sequencing. There might be biases in the mRNA sequencing. Um, <coughs> But also, there's this idea that just because an organism is very abundant uh, within your sample, it isn't necessarily saying that it's particularly active within your sample. So you shouldn't necessarily expect a um, 
high degree of correlation between the mRNA expression and ribosomal RNA expression. All right, so visualizing the results. How are we doing for time? Oh, I'm going over. Sorry. Um, so in terms of visualizing results, I don't know how many of you have been reading a lot of these microbiome papers, genomic papers, and you see figures such as this, where these might be gene ontology categories, or they might be egg pathways, or they might be some kind of functional categories in these bar charts. And you think, well, this really isn't very informative because what does it mean that transcription, what are the genes that are involved in transcription or lipid transport, what does that actually mean in terms of these kinds of pie charts? So I've always found these kind of pie charts looking at the different functions that are expressed relatively unsatisfying and not very informative in terms of really getting at what is happening within your sample. So we've been trying to push more of these kind of systems-based methods. So the idea here is that Genes aren't operating in isolation. They're really parts of these uh, highly interconnected pathways or complexes. And so if we want to interpret, for example, gene expression in one particular gene, we need to know, is that also um, happening in functionally related genes as well? And so that, does that give us additional support that this particular process is actually being upregulated in our particular sample? So there's a number of different systems data sets that we could use with Think about protein complex data sets that are generated from protein protein interaction. Maps, metabolic pathways is probably the best characterized. Um, we really have a good handle on enzyme, enzyme relationships, and enzymes uh, involved in similar biochemical pathways. So metabolic pathways are pretty good, signaling networks, and so forth. So the idea is that can we place our metatranscriptomic data within the context of these kinds of networks to get more at the root of what's actually happening in terms of microbiome function at this kind of more mechanistic level. Um, so one approach that we've been doing is relying on an E. coli protein-protein interaction network. So um, Protein-protein interaction networks tend to be relatively expensive to generate, so we don't have a comprehensive set of protein-protein interaction maps for all the bacteria that are out there that we're going to see in our samples. So we're really just using this E. coli map as a surrogate, as a scaffold on which we can layer on our metatranscriptomic data. Okay, so you can think of this as a template. And what I'm trying to show here is that the abundance that we're getting out from... Um, uh, metatranscriptomic data sets isn't necessarily just a relationship of conservation. So this is an additional consideration that we might want to take into account. If we're trying to enforce our genes that we know are coming from lots of different bacteria onto one single scaffold, there's a homology um, matching step. And so those genes which are really highly conserved, you're going to be able to match easier than those ones which aren't very highly conserved. Where we can see that there's very little correlation, for example, in cell wall biogenesis genes between the conservation and what we actually find in terms of abundance in the data set. So we're kind of satisfied that conservation, relative conservation um, of E. coli genes compared with the other genes that we have in our data set and our transcriptomic genes aren't necessarily impacting our ability to look at the relative abundance of these genes. Um, the other nice thing about placing these genes within these kinds of networks is that we can start thinking about more statistical analyses. So if we're thinking about comparing up and down regulation of genes in one sample compared to another sample, um, one route is just to look at uh, the expression of individual genes. And typically, because you have a large number of genes, your power, your statistical ability to actually find um, genes that are differentially expressed with statistical meaning is really very poor. However, you can boost your statistical signal by grouping things into similar functional categories. So this is where this gene set enrichment analysis comes in. So we can look at groups of genes that might be functionally related or by using these kinds of networks, are they connected with each other within the context of this network? And do we find that genes that tend to be functionally connected, they have these interactions with each other, so they tend to show um, similar patterns of expression, and this can significantly increase your statistical support. 
Uh, visualizing results, I think we went over MG REST. We weren't very enthusiastic about it. Were we? Not very enthusiastic. Okay. Why? <coughs> Just takes a long time, or? Yeah. You're waiting, what, three months for your data set to come back, or? Yeah, my initial use of it was kind of a, not the greatest. We had like cow popping up information, lots of other random things that we were saving that nobody picked up. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so there are these tools out there. There's there's NGRAST, and then there's this one called uh, Megan. Uh, Megan's quite interesting. It has this so these take pathway maps, these these metabolic pathway maps. Uh, this one's a citrate DCA cycle. And I think the nice thing that the Megan does is it can color your enzymes within this pathway and show you which ones are up or down regulated. So that's kind of nice. However, the issue, and this is again a piece of mine, the issue with these kinds of keg pathway representations is the keg database is really being based on, and these maps, these pathway maps that you see, have really been based on curation of three different organisms, E. coli, yeast, human. And so are these different maps really representative of the pathways that you have in all these other organisms that we're sampling and we have no idea? So rather than using these kinds of um, uh, static maps, we're kind of interested more in these network approaches. So we might, so we have that kind of a global network of all of our enzymes, and we can identify where two enzymes share the same substrate. You've now got a possibility of flux through those two enzymes of that substrate being processed through those two enzymes and leading into different parts of the pathway. So these kinds of additional possibilities within any network just aren't captured in KEG. So that's why we're interested in using these kinds of more network approaches. The other thing that we've been looking at is uh, the use of these kind of pie charts. Okay, so these pie charts are uh, associated with a single enzyme, and then the size of the pie charts, the larger it is, the more express it is, and then the colors indicate the contributions of different taxonomic groups towards the expression of that particular enzyme. So this enables you to identify which particular taxa appear to be um, actively expressing certain types of functions within your network. So again, you can start identifying key taxonomic contributions. And then we also have these protein-protein interaction maps that we have from E. coli. And again, um, we can create these kinds of pretty views, and this will be part of your tutorial, just kind of playing around with these kinds of views and looking at layouts and um, getting an understanding of how different groups of genes that are functionally connected. So here these are genes involved in the cell wall biogenesis. Uh, and then we have the uh, SEC, uh, SEC A load, um, uh, kind of set of genes in the secretion system up the top. And then we have some kind of cell wall division genes up the top as well. But these are involved in, I think, um, uh, a kind of glycan biosynthesis. And you can see that there's a large contribution of this um, purple so it might give you an idea as to these are the taxa that are responsible for producing the majority of this particular cell wall component within your microbiome, which may be triggering something associated with your immune system, for example. So these kinds of methods are now starting to enable you to drill down into identifying taxonomic contributions of certain key functions, which you can then, as I keep trying to suggest, design uh, more robust experiments that are more focused on specific sets of genes. Okay, briefly mentioned some statistical considerations. No dedicated software or statistical tool for statistical comparisons of metatranscriptomic data sets have been developed so far. Uh, number of biological replicates. Again, this is an issue. We covered this. At least two, preferably at least three. But again, these are expensive experiments and so we are kind of stuck. But if we if we want to get a lot of meaning out of this and have a colleague that we have a lot of arguments with at sick kids and he's adamant that you need at least four of these experiments and we can say, we can't possibly afford that, Andrew, how are we going to do this? He goes, well, I'm not going to get anything meaningful for you. And it's kind of like, well, we're going to do something, we've got the money, so what are you going to do? So fortunately, again, emphasize the bar in these kinds of studies is relatively low. And think of this really as discovery science. Um, 
If we are going to think about trying to get some statistical support for genes or whatever, there are, we can adapt tools such as the EC, Edge, R, to get differential expression of individual genes. When we've done this, we've actually only found a handful of genes that really uh, fall out from these statistical analyses just because you have so many genes in there and doing the multiple correction testing. Uh, on the other hand, we've had a lot more success with these gene set enrichment analyses. So by combining things into the same function, you're really boosting your statistical power. And um, two methods that you could use for doing these gene set enrichment analyses. One is to look at the um, results of <coughs> programs such as DEseq as to which genes are differentially expressed with some kind of statistical support. What we found works pretty well is just looking at fold change between samples. So you look at fold change for each of your genes and they're involved in the same um, the same kind of process and then you can perform gene cell enrichment analysis and we seem to have reasonable success in doing that. Anyway, have I have I had this home enough that it should be using hypothesis generating requiring subsequent I don't know. All right, so just go over these tools again, DECKHR. There's a new one that, uh, well, it's relatively new called ALDEX2. So this has been developed by Gregory Glaw at the at London, um, in, uh, University of Western Ontario. Uh, and the problem with DECK and EDGEAR, these were initially tools that were developed with microarrays in mind, and they made certain assumptions that don't necessarily hold true for RNA-seq. So ALDEX2 overcomes a lot of the assumptions that uh, DE-seq and EDGE are um, actually made. Some challenges might be which genes we actually include. So do we specify a minimum RPKM cutoff uh, in a similar vein as to which metagenomics reads do we include? Do we just exclude those where you only have one read, for example? And then once we identify these differentially expressed genes, we can analyze them through gene set enrichment analyses, or we could use just whole change. And I don't have a slide saying any questions, but yes. Can you try the, the Calisto and Smooth software? Nope. Yeah, they, they, they're pretty recent. I haven't used them. Like, like I did already in the, in the past, and I used like Edge R and DCQ and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So we tried Edge RD Seq Aldex on uh, these mouse samples, and I think we had four from a colon, four from cecum, just to see what was differentially expressed between the two of them. And I think we got maybe three genes with Edge R, maybe four genes that didn't overlap with DEC, and we got nothing from Aldex. So that's a challenge that you're facing. Yeah is that these tools just aren't picking up anything. And again, it's probably to do with the number of biological replicates, but there we had four. But there were different mice as well. But. All right, questions, yes? For the target validation, is that still follow the uh, general RNA-seq Excuse me, um, for the uh, qPCR, is the one? <laughs> I don't know. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, again, it will depend on the samples that you're collecting because if you get certain samples and you're really struggling to extract RNA from those samples, you're not going to have any left for the validation step afterwards, so then you have to go back and target another cohort, potentially. So, like sputum samples, for example, it's quite hard to actually extract sufficient RNA to get enough for the sequencing. Yeah. When you have a set of samples, uh, before you go through uh, further analysis, are you, during the filtration with the host being made, do you do that after assembling or before assembling? Which uh, 
Um, I think we do it before assembly because if we have a host genome, your ability to actually annotate those reads to that host genome is pretty high. And it's a relatively quick step. So again, anything you can do to get rid of the stuff you're not interested in as soon as possible is really beneficial. Have, have you tried stamp? You should, yeah, it'd be good to test that and see what its performance is like relative to DEC. It's probably awesome, isn't it? Yes, we are. Um, so, so, so the two main projects that we're pushing at the moment, one is a study of kids with IBD from the South Asian community. So these are um, people who are immigrating to Canada from um, South Asia tend to show a um, decreased risk of IBD relative to um, uh, European Caucasians that are here. When they immigrate at a certain age or after a certain when they, Just when they immigrate. So that they, they have a decreased risk, full stop. But the kids that are born to those parents have the same elevated risk of IBD as the European Caucasian kids. So there's something in the environment that they're picking up, with, or this is a hypothesis, that is contributing towards the development of IBD. So we're looking at, um, and again, it's to do with costs. So these are 40 families, so the power is relatively low, but this is one of the few cohorts where we can actually get biopsies, where we think that these more informative sites that are associated with the inflammation of the gut. Um, and so this is going to be generating metatranscriptome data from two different sites within the guts of these patients, and then doing comparisons with metabolomics and 16S and metagenomics and so forth. So it's, a really, it's really just a discovery exercise of what we can actually do with this kind of technology and what we might be able to learn. The other study that we're doing is chickens, which is a little bit of a hard sell at a children's hospital, but uh, again, it's to do with our inability to get the more informative sample. So if we want to understand something about the relationship between diet uh, additives, in this case, these uh, growth promoting antibiotics that we hear a lot about and we need to eliminate them from livestock within the next two or so years, we need to find alternatives. And so by working with chickens, we now have the ability to have a fairly standardized set of diets that we don't have with humans. So you're minimizing some of the variables that we have with these studies. And more importantly, with these chickens, we can actually get the samples of different sites of the intestine uh, at different time points that, um, because you're using different batches of chickens, that you just can't get with humans. So that's, that's where we're currently headed. All right, so we are currently on a 10-minute coffee break.